We've been looking at hash functions, cryptographic hash functions. These are objects whose purpose it is to compress data. You give them long inputs and you get short outputs. And the security property they should have is that it's hard to find two different inputs with the same output. Even though these collisions exist mathematically, not only do they exist, but there's tons of them, it should be hard for someone to actually put their hands on one. So quite an intriguing problem as to how you design a function with this property, particularly given that you're not allowed to keep anything secret. There's no secret key. There is a key, but it's known to the adversary. So we gave definitions and examples, and we're now going to look more at how they're designed in practice. We saw as an example SHA-256, and when we looked at its design, at its core was something we called a compression function. We wrote that as little SHA-256. And the hash function itself was just an iteration of this compression function. So that compression step is going to be our starting point. In some ways, that's the heart of the design. So a compression function then is simply another family of functions. It takes a k-bit key and it takes an input which has a fixed length, which we write as b plus n. b is the block length of the message and n is the length of the chaining variable and is also the output length of the compression function. When we build a hash function on top of this, n will continue to be the output length of the hash function and messages will have arbitrary length, but they'll be broken into b-bit blocks. So this will emerge as the tool for compressing or hashing one message block. So as an example, many of these designs set the block length to 512. For SHA-256, the output length was 256. And in that case, our compression function would take 768 input bits to 256 output bits. In that case, it's keyless. You can think of k as being zero, so that the set of possible keys consists only of the empty string, and we would omit it. But in general, uh, everything we are doing here for a while is works just as well with keys or without. So a compression function is actually just a hash function. It's taking long inputs, 768 bits, to short outputs, 256, and the security goal is identical. It's supposed to be collision resistant. We want it to be hard to find two inputs with the same output. When we write the input for a compression function, the 768-bit string, we view it as having two parts. One is b bits long, 512. The other is n bits long, 256. And thus the picture looks like this. So even though these are written separately to disambiguate their semantic content, in practice, they're just concatenated, so it's really one input. And so then the compression function is written like this. The key is viewed as just embedded in there because we don't really usually care much about it beyond that it, when you fix it, you get a function from this space to this space. And so you have your output coming out here written like this. The reason people look at and design compression functions is that it's possible to reduce the design of a hash function to the design of a collision resistant compression function in the following sense. If we succeed in designing a compression function here and succeed in validating in some way or at least gaining confidence that it really is collision resistance, our task is done. Why is that? Because we then have an automatic method to lift this compression function up to a full-fledged hash function, meaning given merely the ability to, uh, to hash inputs of length, let's say 768, as represented by the common choices of BNN, we would get the ability to hash inputs of any length. And furthermore, we would be guaranteed that this hashing is collision resistant under the assumption that it was true for the compression function. So this is a significant effort saver in terms of building hash functions. Right? 
So the method by which we do this is to start from a compression function, which for the moment I'm going to see as given. We will later discuss how to build them, but for now you're handed one and you're handed one with a guarantee that it is hard to find collisions. And my task is to build from that a full-fledged hash function. It has to take inputs from some large set D, the set of all strings up to some very big maximum length, for example, and compress them down to n-bit strings, and it has to be collision resistant. And the claim is that there is a way to build big H from little h. Not any way will do, but a very specific way that we call MD. And it has this nice attribute that it preserves collision resistance in a provable way. If I know that the compression function is collision resistant, the hash function is guaranteed to be so. And so the problem of hashing long inputs has been provably reduced to the problem of hashing fixed length inputs. So why do we do this? What are the benefits? It's that if you trust your compression function, you can trust your hash function. There is in fact no need to try to attack your hash function because it simply will not have any weakness unless there actually was one in the compression function. So you may as well put your design effort into good compression functions. And this savings allowing you to reduce the problem to one that started out being about inputs of arbitrary lengths to now being one about inputs of fixed lengths is important enough that this is widely used. So the MD and SHA-2 series, in particular SHA-256, use this paradigm. And that's why we saw a compression function at the heart of SHA-256. Actually, the newest family of hash functions does use a different paradigm, which we'll touch on a bit later. So let's um, see how this MD transform works. So what is it trying to do? We are given a compression function. At the moment, I don't care how it works, but I assume I have code to compute it. And it has a block length and an output length, B and N. And I want to build from that a hash function H, which takes very long inputs and returns N bit outputs and is collision resistant given that little h is. So a bit of notation to start with we are going to want to break the input into blocks and kind of hash block by block. And I'm going to assume that the length of an input to the hash function is a multiple of the block length b. If you remember, SHA-256 ensured that by first doing some padding, but that's a pretty generic thing. So it's simpler from our purposes here, just assume that's done. So we are starting with inputs that are already a multiple of uh, the block length. The number of blocks in the input is then this notation over here, which is the length of m divided by b. So now I can parse the message into b bit blocks and that'll be written this way. Another thing we'll need is that the block indexes will actually play a role in the, in the construction and code. So I want to take a blocks index, which is an integer between 0 and to the b minus 1, and write it as a binary string of length b. So an integer in this range, this denotes its b-bit binary representation. By the way, the fact that we need to do this is why we limit the length of inputs to the hash function to be at most 2 to the power b, so that the block index can in fact be written in one block. So here's how the transform works. What does it mean that it's a transform? It's just a way of constructing big H from little h. All it does is it defines big H by some by this piece of code. So it takes the key and a message of which is long and the picture shows this case of two block messages and generalizes quite easily. So here are our two blocks. To be concrete, each block is 512 bits. In general, it's b bits, the b over here. So our compression function member can take one such b bit block and another n bits and return n bits. You run it with the first message block and some constant, which for our 
example here is set to 0 but SHA-256 for example set it differently and the result will be some n-bit string and now you just repeat take the next block of the message take that string pump it back through the compression function and get another n-bit string now you might think maybe we should stop there but there's one more step you apply the compression function one more time with the message block input set to the binary representation of the number of blocks in the data. So the integer 2, in this case because there are two blocks, is turned into a B or 512-bit string. That's stuck into here and the last iteration is on that and that's the output of the hash function. And if you want to see it in pseudocode, it's up here. Extract the number of blocks in the message append the length of the message or the, num length, the number of blocks in it as the last block so the message is now grown in length by one block start this chaining variable at zero and then keep doing this and create more values and return the last one this theorem explains what is good about this method and it's one more example of a proof of security. It validates this construction by saying that the only way to break the big hash function h is to break the small one little h. So the way it's phrased is you're given a compression function little h with its various parameters. Let's design the big hash function h as we saw before, not arbitrarily but very specifically via the MD transform we saw in the prior slide. And now I want to say that this big H is collision resistant. How is that formulated? It says, suppose you hand me an attacker A sub big H, and this is trying to find collisions in big H. If you run it, it'll have some advantage, some probability of success that it returns a valid collision for big H. However, given this big H, A sub big H, I can construct another adversary, A sub little h, which attacks the compression function. And it finds collisions in the compression function with a success probability that's at least this number over here. What this equation means is that if we are willing to assume that the compression function is really collision resistant, that means we know that this is a small number. Why is that? Because this adversary is assumed to be practical in resources, and so um, the assumption would mean it doesn't do too well. But now the equation says this one doesn't do too well either, and that's a quite nice, strong conclusion. It's saying our belief in the security of little h has transferred over into big H. There's no way to break big H that doesn't translate into some way to break little h. So this is the kind of theorem which your uh, part of your task would be to understand and be able to apply. So you might get exercises and questions which ask you to understand what it's saying, what its implications are, and, um, and apply it in specific settings. Now, we've often, at least not often, but in the past when I've given a theorem like this, say for encryption, we've punted on the um, proof. And, uh, and uh, here we'll kind of take the same approach. So um, we've now done one step of the um, process of building a hash function which is we've reduced it to the design of a compression function. The second step is how do we get the compression function? And that's not easy. The way cryptographers approach this, which is a common paradigm, is that uh, let's be conservative. We know how to design block ciphers. We're very good at that. Let's try to leverage that. Let's make compression functions out of block ciphers. So suppose I'm handed a block cipher E, and inside SHA-256, remember, it was constructed. And let's say it has B-bit keys and N-bit blocks. 
From it, I want a compression function which takes b plus m bits to n bits. Now, although so far we've had keys involved, we're dropping them here. We're turning to the setting of SHA-256 where the, uh, there are no keys, it's keyless. And so that input vanishes. You're thinking of the compression function as just taking the input and returning the output and correspondingly the hash function we build will do the same. Okay, so how could we possibly get a compression function from the block cipher? So here's a suggestion. I have b plus n bit inputs and I have to compress them down to n bits. But the compression function is actually capable of taking b plus n bits as input. It takes a b bit key and n bit input and gets an n bit output. So why don't I take my b bit message block and use it as a key and then take the v bit chaining variable and use it as an input and apply the block cipher. This is a perfectly well-defined operation and it does the job of compressing this longer input down to a shorter output. If this function was collision resistant would be done because then the MD paradigm says put that design on top and, you're, and you get a full-fledged collision resistant hash function. So well, it looks like we're nearly there. We just need to check that this thing is collision resistant. Well, if you start checking that, what is the question we're asking? What we're asking is, can an adversary find inputs to little h, which are distinct but result in the same output? Given that the function is defined this way, you're kind of asking whether you can solve a certain equation. What's the equation? I need to find two inputs. Remember, each input is, a, is of this form, x, v. The whole thing is an input to little h. So two inputs means an x1, v1, and an x2, v2. What should they satisfy? That h has the same value on both of them, which means that this is the same for both of them. So e under x1 of v1 has to equal e under x2 of v2. If you can find an adversary outputting such x1, v1, x2, v2, you violated collision resistance. If you can't, then maybe things are looking good. So let's stare at that equation. Can we find a way to solve it? We have a ton of flexibility because the fact is that everything is open to the attacker to choose other than, of course, the function e itself. x1, v1, x2, v2 are all variables and it has complete control over all of them. And indeed, that flexibility can be exploited but the reason you can exploit it is because block ciphers are invertible. So looking at this equation, what you can do is fix x1, fix v1, and fix x2. Okay, So that's what our adversary does. It fixes x1 to some value, x2 to some other value, and it fixes v1 to some value. That leaves only v2 undetermined. But then looking at this, you can solve for v2. Why is that? You apply e sub x2 inverse to the quantity here. So if I compute y, which is this, and apply e x2 inverse to y, I will have solved for v2. What does that exploit? Crucially, that if you have the key for a block cipher, you can run the inverse and invert it at any point of your choice. The attacker here was capable of choosing the key. It could set x2 to any value it wanted, and then it could use this inversion property. As usual, our adversary is in the form of CR model. It plays the CR game. That means that it would get as input a key if one existed, but since we're in a keyless setting, that isn't there. And then it just finds and outputs a collision. The collision is the pair x1 v1 is the first message, x2 v2 is the second message, and it has advantage 1. Well, so this is not going that well. We tried to use block ciphers and we failed. So what next? Now you might think, okay, we need to give up on that. Block ciphers are not going to be worthwhile or useful as a tool to get compression functions that are collision resistant. But that turns out not to quite be the case. In fact, and this is another thing that comes up fairly often in crypto, it doesn't take much of a tweak for this to work. What we're going to do is, again, have the same block cipher, 
and slightly change how we define the compression function. Given inputs x and v, as before, it applies the block cipher with key the message block x and input the chaining variable v. But after doing that, it just xors v back in. That's okay because v has length n and so does this thing over here. You can do that. Okay, we now have another candidate compression function and does this work? And you might think, well, the prior attempt didn't work. This is almost the same. How much different can it be? But curiously enough, it's quite different. You can try to attack it. Suppose you consider an adversary trying to find a collision, as before, that involves solving an equation. The equation is take this with an input x1, v1, then take it with an input x2, v2, and you want to find values of x1, v1, and x2, v2, which make the equation true. As before, you are in control of all inputs. You can pick x1, v1, x2, v2, all four of them, and you just have to make this equation true. But despite being in control of all four inputs, it's actually not clear how you solve this equation because every time you try to fix a couple of them, uh, it's not possible to solve for the other one. So in particular, if you revisit the attack of the prior slide, where we applied E sub X to inverse somehow to something over here, the difficulty is that there's a V2 both inside here and outside here. And so if you solve for this V2, well, it's not quite going to mesh with this one. Of course, none of that is any sort of proof or evidence that is not possible to solve this equation. But the fact is that people don't seem to know how, at least for well-designed block ciphers. And the result is that this is effectively what works as far as we know and what's used. So this is called the Davis-Meyer compression function. You take a block cipher and you define little h exactly as we said. And this is used in uh, many of these hash function series in both MD and SHA-2, except modular the fact that sometimes they don't use XOR, but instead use some kind of integer addition module or something. So for example, the compression function of SHA-256, remember we had described that uh, at the beginning of this chapter. And as we had seen there, Internally, it used a block cipher E, and we had also said, modulo some missing details, how this E block cipher worked. If you go back and compare and consider how this was defined in terms of E, you'll see that it is indeed doing this, except that it's replaced the XOR with some other similar addition type modular op operations. Okay. So what that look leaves us with is we actually have a pretty good and complete description or understanding of how practical hash functions work. And we also have a pretty good structural understanding of what their strengths are and why they have those strengths. To recap a bit, we have a design of compression functions from block ciphers that in fact has been well studied so that if block ciphers are suitably strong, you can believe that that works. And we have the MD transform, which then lifts the compression function to a full-fledged hash function, and we have a proof that that works. That doesn't mean that these hash functions are secure. After all, we don't have proofs that the block ciphers underlying them are good, nor in fact do we even have a precise definition of what good would mean in this context, but that's another story. So it's far from being the case that we can walk away thinking that the hash functions we've built are strong. And indeed, people need to look at and have looked at them closely to see whether there's anything in the structure that can be exploited for an attack. We know that there are always birthday attacks, but birthday attacks can be put out of reach by just picking an output length big enough. If the output length like for SHA-1 is 160 bits, the birthday attack takes time to do the 80 and it's prohibited. But the question then is, are there better attacks which are not quite as dumb, one might say, as the birthday attack, which doesn't look at or care at all what the internal structure of the hash function is?
Just like for DES, differential and linear cryptanalysis were able to exploit structure to find better attacks than exhaustive key search, can we for hash functions look at the block cipher underlying it, find some weaknesses somewhere in the design, and then use that to find collisions? And uh, the fact is that although historically people thought they were doing a pretty good job, we have now discovered that many of the hash functions we had in the past are indeed susceptible to these times of attacks. And it's been um, a fairly uh, long sequence of negative news. So let's take a look at a little bit of what's been going on and what kind of timeline it had. The first indications of weaknesses already emerged in the early 90s when collisions were found in the compression function of the MD5 hash function. What does that mean? Well, remember that we have a proof that if the compression function is collision resistant, so is the hash function. In other words, if this works, so does this work. This attack is saying, but this doesn't work. Now, that doesn't mean this doesn't work. It just means that we don't know anymore whether it works or not. This gap was enough for some amount of users and um, software developers to say, well, you haven't actually broken this, so let's ignore the attacks on this. Okay, so that's what they did. It proved to not be such a great idea. By the early 2000s, somewhat surprisingly, and in news that was um, widely uh, known at the time, collisions were actually found in the MD5 hash function. The reason this was such big news is that this thing was ubiquitously used all over the place. And yet, by now at least, we can find MD5 collisions within minutes on using software that you can download on the internet. So MD5 has been completely broken. Collisions are very, very easy to find. And it's it's no news now, but if you go back to those days, it was it was surprising that that was possible. At that point, then the suggestion was switch to SHA-1. SHA-1 had this longer output length, it had a stronger design, and people felt pretty comfortable that that would be okay. But even in SHA-1, weaknesses were starting to show up. So here was an attack in the mid two thousands. Its running time was still prohibitive. This is not the um, an amount of operations you would easily do in any sense, but it's short of the birthday attack time. Remember the birthday attack time for SHA-1 would be 2 to the 80 because the output length is 160. And so this is definitely saying there are structural weaknesses and that's a cause for worrying. It took a fair amount of time before this translated into a practical attack, but by 2017 people were actually able to find and return SHA-1 collisions. And it's estimated that the work uh, required was this. This is very, very high. It's still not something you do on your laptop by far. But with a lot of computing power and clusters of computers, they were able to do this. And this is enough to regard the hash function as, as broken. Indeed, you see the impact by the time this happened. In fact, even a little before it happened, most of the big browsers were uh, had already stopped accepting certificates based on SHA-1. The reason is that if you can find collisions in SHA-1, you can forge these certificates, which would enable you to forge the websites um, effectively underlying them. And so they decided they're not taking that risk, and that was justified. So where do we stand now? Well, the next thing in this series is the SHA-256 and FA-512 hash functions. They appear so far to be fine. No one seems to have any weaknesses in them or any attacks. But given this history, you know, who knows how long that's going to last. Uh, it's interesting to see the various ways and places these things happen. This is a curious story of an exploit based on the MD5 attack. So Flame was a piece of malware that was deployed in, in 
various places. It infected computers in Iran um, at some point. And eventually it was discovered, and, and there are speculations, although no claims, I think, publicly about who, des who designed it. But one of the elements is that if you look at flame, it included inside it an MD5 collision attack, and it used that to forge certificates. And moreover, this attack, as indicated here, is interesting from a scientific viewpoint. It wasn't just an obvious copy of existing attacks. There were some clever cryptanalysts who had improved the attack in some way and were using that to, to forge um, certificates and infiltrate some systems through this malware. Sort of a, an odd place as to how cryptanalysts um, enters. Here's the first announcement for the SHA-1 collision. So what they did is they posted two PDF files. You can see that the files have different content, but um, if you compute their SHA-1 hashes, they turn out to be the same. Uh, we'll see this more later, but it may be interesting to see a certificate. So this is a, you can pull this up on your computer. Uh, this is what a certificate looks like. And inside the certificate, you see that it's using SHA-1. And nowadays, that means that it would not be accepted by most um, browsers. This is the announcement from certain uh, browser vendors about the fact that they are ceasing to support certificates that use SHA-1. Notice this came out in 2016. So they were uh, proactive. They, they stopped using these things before the attack actually happened, which, is, which makes good sense. Uh, there are possible implications. You might ask, what is the implication for things like Bitcoin? If you can find hash collisions, how does it impact the security of Bitcoin? And there are discussions of this out there. And, uh, and the significance is not necessarily enough at this point to really create uh, practical difficulties with Bitcoin. But it's good to stay on top of these things. There's a kind of philosophical question here it may be fun to ask or look at, and it'll exercise, I think, your skills in critical thinking and evaluation a little bit. What is wrong with cryptographers? Why aren't we building secure hash functions? We've built all these things and they're all getting broken. Well, take your pick. So suppose you were grading cryptographers' performance. What are you going to give them? An A, a B, a C, or an F? A means they're doing really well. B means they're doing okay. C means they're doing pretty badly. And F means just forget about it and let some machine learning algorithms design hash functions. So what do you think? Well, you may have many different answers. Let me give you what I think is um, my perspective, which is, of course, highly subjective. My sense is that, in theory, cryptographers are good at designing hash functions. It's not like the methods they use are fundamentally flawed. The difficulty is that they are, they are very performance constrained, and so they cut corners as much as perform, possible to maintain very high speed. You can see that in the designs, like SHA-256 can run at a few cycles per byte, and uh, it takes you know, a fraction of a nanosecond per byte. That's ridiculously fast. And if you look at that, it's kind of amazing that you can get any kind of security at such a cost. Suppose you told cryptographers it's fine to take a 10-factor slowdown. What they could then do is they could up the number of rounds in the block cipher. So their block cipher currently from Bashar 256 had 64 rounds. Suppose you even double it, you would massively increase the strength. Imagine if you multiply the number of rounds by 10. It's really difficult to imagine that attacks could be found then. So if you give people more elbow room with regard to performance, I believe they could push security up a lot. But the performance constraints and pressures are definitely a detriment here. Um, in any case, regardless, all these events and others 
led the government to once again say, as they had with the death story, that it's time to really think differently about hash functions and define a, a really new, different family of hash functions, and we'll call it SHA-3. Just like for AES, which was a very successful effort, they decided that they're not going to design it. They're going to ask cryptographers all over the world to design it and go through the same sort of competition, competitive process. Have cryptographers submit designs. There would be a family of functions with different output lengths. The government would tell them what security properties they wanted. And it would also set some kind of efficiency bars. Again, these are, these are very um, demanding. The function is supposed to be faster than SHA-256 and nonetheless uh, secure. And then say, okay, you folks submit your designs and you folks also evaluate them, beat up on each other's designs. And um, after that process continues for a while, we'll select some kind of winner. So this uh, process took a while. There were an initial phase of submissions, a first round in which a few were selected, and then slowly, slowly it was whittled down to a final winner. It started out with 64 submissions, and that fairly quickly went down to 51, with a few dismissed with simple attacks or not meeting criteria or something like that. Already by then it was harder, and the process took a while to come to this round two, where 14 designs were left. And you can see the names of those 14 designs over here. More analysis of all kinds left us with five finalists. And final selection, this one over here. Now, throughout this, there's of course, in people's minds somehow, the sense that the criterion is what, how secure is it? What, what can you, can you break things or not? The fact is that at least as we got towards the end of the competition, many things looked secure. And security was not so much the concern in deciding between them as performance. So the analysis and evaluations were not merely security. People were implementing these things on every possible platform, hardware and software, and performance played a big role in selecting Kechak. Um, again, the rule of thumb is the fastest unbroken hash function wins. So UCSD had a fair bit of a role. I think three of these 64 were UCSD. Um, I think only one made it past here. I was involved in this. This was a hash function whose team I was part of. Uh, we made it to the finalists and we lost then. The reason we lost, apparently, as far as we understand, is that hardware performance wasn't good enough. It wasn't a security issue. If you're interested in details, here's a more uh, detailed description of the process. So here you see all the hash functions in the very first part, and then you see what happened to start dropping them. Right? This shows attacks. So red means a really bad attack, finding a collision. Orange is a somewhat less damaging but still important attack, violating second pre-image, for example, which is a, a weak form of collision resistance and so forth. And so here you see quite a lot of attacks and that led to these functions being dropped. This is what was left moving up into the next round. And now you see that security is much improved. Of all of these candidates over here, only one of them was there some kind of attack, and even that is a mild attack. Right? So they were doing way better for security. Nonetheless, choices had to be made, and then these were the ones that survived to the penultimate round, of course, adding the one up here. Again, there was a little bit of a security weakness in one of them, but otherwise no significant security problems found. Uh, so performance was the main dictator on that then was the winner. So what does this um, Ketchak hash function look like? Well, it's interesting because it really uses a different paradigm. It's not based on this MD transform. It's not based on a compression function of the form we saw. Instead, the core underlying object is a fixed permutation, which is called F. 
it um, takes inputs of a certain length and gives you outputs of the same length. There's no key. It's a keyless object and it's entirely public. How do you do the hashing? Well, as usual, you pad the message. So you get some number of message blocks and you'll eat them up one at one by one. You start with a zero string of length r plus c. Add in the first message block to the top part. Nothing added to the bottom part. Run it through your permutation. Get your output, break it into two parts, r bits here and c bits here. Add in your second message block and keep going. Now, if you stopped when you finished uh, your pass through the message, you have a bit of a problem because this public permutation is easily invertible. Its inverse is also public and easy to compute. And if I give you this output, you can easily go backwards. And that's not a great thing. The way they resolve that is simply by truncation. So they start dro dropping bits through some truncation operation so that you don't have all the output necessary to apply the permutation. And it seems to work well enough. We seem to get a hash function, which as far as people can tell, works well. Uh, this is a nice tool they've developed out of it. This is a function which takes a message and then it takes another argument saying, how many bits of output do you want? And it returns exactly that many bits of output. Okay, we'll stop there for or hash functions.